Thank you very much, Arusha, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, and I might uh, want to thank the in, uh, organizers for inviting me today, um, and also uh, for Professor Fernando, who is also my mentor um, as Arusha's, and for laying a nice platform for me to build my talk on. So uh, as Arusha said, I'm a consultant neurologist by trade. I also uh, do, do an audit lead role as a mortality lead role for my uh, directorate. Um, if I may draw your attention to this slide, um, like uh, in Sri Lanka, UK had a very interesting health minister who recently said that there are 750 avoidable deaths a month in the NHS hospitals. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is equivalent to two full jumbo jets falling off the sky and perishing every month. If this were to happen in the UK or in Sri Lanka, I do not think people will turn a blind eye to that. People will be very passionate about investigating it and making sure that lessons are learned to prevent it happening again. So if you stay with the airline industry theory, what are the odds of an aircraft falling off the sky? is one in 1.2 million flights. It's extremely rare, but when this happens, people get very passionate about learning what are the processes which contributed to it and how we can prevent it. I'm sure like the pilots who try till the last minute to prevent the plane crashing or avoid uh, the unexpected crash, the doctors also do try their very best to prevent harm to a patient, but sometimes incidents do occur and patients could die or they could be seriously harmed but it is important that we learn from these mistakes or processes. When you talk about these processes, people will talk about human error. So what is human error? Human error is what you see as the tip of the iceberg. But what you don't see are the processes, the culture, and other manifestations which lead up to the human error. It is, it is likely that the human error is the symptom of the problem than the wider care system. It is important that we move away from the human, being focused on the human error. Human error is a normal part of everyday life and in, even also in the workplace. And it is a natural condition and occurrence that enables us to develop, learn, and function. So morbidity, mortality related learning and improvement, it could be more objective, meaningful and effective. If we learn to move away from focusing on human error, but also focus on the system that led to these errors, I think we could increase uh, engagement of um, professionals who deliver health care, the policy makers, the managers, um, et cetera, in order to in ensure patient safety. Well, I work for Sheffield Teaching Hospitals Trust, which is one of the um, largest NHS organizations in uh, uh, recruiting 15,000 uh, staff and serving about 2.5 million people in the area. But with this comes the challenge of having to deal with 3,000 deaths a year and three un uh, serious untoward incidents that Professor Fernando uh, mentioned earlier. With this comes the challenge of having to learn from these deaths and ensure that the lessons are uh, um, inculcated into the staff members and, and we prevent, uh, uh, prevent the avoidable deaths. To do so, we need to work as a team to put the pieces of the puzzle together to learn the lessons. So in this cartoon, uh, you could see there's a river in the middle and on top of the picture is, uh, um, is the land that the process of managing after death uh, occurs and before the river are the processes uh, towards the end of life before the patient dies. After a patient dies, the process of managing uh, the death crosses over the bridge and in doing so, the, sometimes the patient will go to the mortuary or if there are any concerns of the patient's death, the coroner's coroner might be involved, the coroner's courts uh, uh, might happen. If there are no issues, then the relatives will bury the patient and, and, and then bereave. But before the death, there'll be uh, doctors, the nurses, healthcare professionals, like uh, ambulance crews, the police, they would be involved. So it is important to remember that doctors 
uh, uh, involvement is only a very small part. There are large processes involved around the patient's death. In resolving and understanding this puzzle, it is important to piece together different pieces of this puzzle. Structured judgment review of mortality is one piece in this large puzzle. Why is it important to review mortality is to be enabled to quickly identify concerns and feedback into the system to make sure that we don't do the same mistake again. We learn quickly that the one important piece of this jigsaw puzzle is, uh, to bring the rest of the pieces together is to be able to learn from every death. Now, if an organization is of a certain scale, you might be dealing with large number of deaths. So you might not have the resources and the man manpower to deal with each and every case. So therefore, your department or, or, or the hospital might want to decide that you apply a certain set of criteria to study each death. So in, in my department, although we study all deaths, we ensure that we focus mainly on the patients who are younger, that's less than 50 years of age, those who have been electively admitted for procedures, and vulnerable people like people with mental health or learning difficulties and dementia. And of course, if a patient's family or the patient has raised a complaint during their care, we make sure that those patients are, uh, and are assessed carefully to see whether we have uh, missed anything or whether we can le uh, learn any lessons. Learning from death is uh, not something that is unique to Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. It is part of a national program called the National Mortality Case Record Review Program. And this program uses an evidence-based tool called Structured Judgment Review. Um, and this allows you to assess patients' death objectively and generate qualitative and both quantitative data. This is what it looks like. It has two uh, components. One is an assessment of the care of the patient that they received from admission to the hospital until death. In the initial uh, admission for the first 24 hours, mid, late, and overall care is scored out of one to five, which is a visual analog scale. Now, when we analyze the patient's death, the reviewer is expected to give explicit judgment of uh, what's happening. What is explicit judgment? This has to be based on the information at hand and whether to see the patient, uh, the, the managing team, the professionals have followed hospital guidelines and protocols. In other words, um, it is like telling somebody, well, on the weather report it says that Colombo will have tropical shower tomorrow morning, so you're going out, I would advise you take an umbrella. That is an explicit statement. What is an implicit statement is your mother might say, well, son, you're going out, sky looks a bit dark, it's best to take an umbrella if I, because you might get wet. Now, that is an implicit judgment based on some evidence, but you, you make up the story in between the lines. We encourage the reviewers to make explicit judgment based on uh, evidence and the protocols in the trust or in the hospital. We also look at uh, the avoidability of the death judgment. Now this is scored between one and six. One means definitely avoidable death. For example, patient comes for a knee joint replacement but dies of penicillin allergy and the patient is known to have penicillin allergy and if somebody gave penicillin patient dies, then that is an avoidable death. Definitely not avoidable death is, for example, a patient uh, who may be 85 years of age, suffering with dementia, persons with a large stroke, and patient dies of a chest infection in the hospital. Well, you need to look into this death, but still, it might not be avoidable. So in between the scale are several other numbers, and, and, and it is based on, on, on the reviewer's judgment to decide whether avoidability is between one or six. Every death that is uh, scored as avoidable, that means between one and five, will be very seriously assessed by uh, the clinical governance team to make sure that what went wrong. So when we assess these patients, there are a number of themes and different data sets that are generated. And these, not only by, we don't stop at looking at the patient's death and analyzing them. When we figure out what are the themes which, generated, which are generated from this analysis, this, these 
themes are then fed back into the clinical governance process. So the managers, the clinicians will be looking into improving the patient care standards based on this data. And there, as Professor Fernando said, there, this will generate certain audit processes to see if the existing care is in line with the gold standards published by the colleges or national body or international bodies. And it might raise concerns about, well, we might have to improve our transparency in care of our patient, uh, keeping the family and the patient at heart. This might also lead to certain research ideas and innovative ways of improving patient care. And that is how you use the information generated by doing the mortality morbidity assessments. Um, in Sheffield, we have a, a mortality, mortality morbidity meeting every quarter, and we have about 24 deaths every three months, and we choose cases to discuss. We don't discuss all the cases because that would bore the clinicians to death. So we, ba we select our cases based on uh, whether they are young, whether they have any underlying problems like mental health disorders, or if the cause of death is unexpected. For example, if the patient was admitted for Guillain-Barre syndrome in the UK, you don't expect them to die. If they die, then of course you need to find out what, what went wrong. So let me give an example case. And this is a 79-year-old man um, who was admitted very recently uh, to the ward, and he died after about 10 days. And his death certificate said he died of ischemic stroke. And uh, death certificate comes in two parts. The second part said septicemia, secondary to urinary tract infection, and dementia. Most of my colleagues will say, come on, what is there to learn in this patient's death? He's, seven, he's very old. He's, 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 he's got dementia. He's died of a large stroke. However, as I mentioned earlier, this is a vulnerable patient. So patient with dementia, we might, there might be lessons to learn. And this patient's reviewer had given low scores. So based on these two factors, we decided to look at this case. So let me take you through the analysis. So is that the pointer? OK, so. Um, I don't know whether you can see. So this patient uh, was, um, has had a couple of falls at home, and, and the paramedics were alerted. Paramedics went to see the patient pretty soon, and um, they had an exit. So the, uh, the reviewer will assess the patient's assessment at the scene, and they documented that this patient was fast negative. That means face arm speech uh, assessment for negative for stroke but they recorded the patient had mild temperature and was unable to get up, so therefore the patient was brought into hospital. Uh, at the A&E, it was assessed that the patient has a previous history of seizures, and probably this patient has had seizures, and that is why he has fallen. So the reviewer scores that the assessments were done accordingly, very quickly, the patient was assessed in a timely fashion, therefore the score of five was given, which is good care. And when you move on to the initial assessment in the neurology department, the reviewer only scored three. And when you look at the reasons for that, uh, the junior doctor who assessed the patient has taken the history from the A&E notes because the patient was aphasic, didn't give a good history. You are expected to be able to uh, uh, assess the previous medical notes or call the patient's family to find, or the GP practice to find out more information. This junior doctor didn't do that. And furthermore, the patient decided, uh, sorry, the junior doctor decided to start the patient on an anti-epileptic drug at a dose that she saw on an old clinic note which says one gram BD of levetiracetam when the patient was actually on 1.5 grams BD. Now this was recorded as unacceptable. And, and uh, in, 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 in the, uh, the below point, the reviewer says that care could have been optimized if the person who admitted the patient took an extra effort to go and do a proper documentation. So this raises the, uh, uh, the concept of need to improve documentation. As Professor Fernando mentioned, this is an important aspect that we drive in our, in our hospitals to improve documentation. Uh, and then also, the junior doctor can't document if the notes are not there when the patient is admitted. So there are processes to improve 
availability of medical notes on the ward when a patient comes in. And then the 20, next 24-hour care is assessed by the reviewer and doesn't give a five out of five, but gives a four, which is fair score. Now, why was this given? Uh, why was this score given? It was found that um, the patient's uh, brain scan, or MRI scan, showed multiple strokes. Registrar has done a fantastic assessment and, uh, and initiated the initial treatment. However, it was found that the consultant who was in, on call hadn't seen the patient within 24 hours. Now, it is our hospital policy a patient who was admitted through acute admission should be seen by a consultant within 14 hours. So this patient's care, in that sense, was breached uh, by the said consultant. So it was raised as a concern. And then when he come, came to the middle of the uh, uh, mid-care of the patient, it was found that this patient has, um, has developed tachycardia and respiratory signs, and this, the patient was running high fever. And then the, the team has recognized this very early and started the appropriate antibiotics. Now, this is good care. And we not only pick up on, we don't expect to pick up only the bad care, but we also celebrate good care and also feed that back to the team so that they, we celebrate uh, um, achievements as well in the process of morbidity mortality assessments. When it came to the la uh, towards the latter half of the patient's care, the patient suddenly drops the GCS, and it was found that this patient have, has, has had a large bleed. The team managing the patient uh, initiates some palliative care uh, uh, processes, but does not involve the palliative care team until three days later. Now, in, in our hospital, if somebody was thought to be in the end of life, uh, it, is, it is considered extremely important that the patient is kept distress-free, comfortable, and less agitated. One of the processes we do is by involving the palliative care team who's, who, uh, who are experts in managing this. So the reviewer says this patient's care is only three out of five because end-of-life care process was not initiated. Now, how has this helped? How has this patient's assessment contributed to a care in my, on my ward? We do audits uh, uh, regularly on these processes of end-of-life care, sepsis management, documentation, and, and uh, sometimes the junior doctors are required to perform these audits as part of their training, and sometimes the clinicians who are concerned about patient care, who want to improve their uh, uh, standards, and perhaps for their appraisal, there are various drivers for them to do these audits. And in, this, in one of the audits that they have done, it showed that not only this patient, there were several other patients whose end-of-life care was not improved uh, or, or uh, initiated in a timely manner. So this led to a departmental training day on end-of-life care and dealing with patients um, towards uh, um, uh, late part of their care. And then also there was a training program on advanced care planning. So this is how even an unavoidable case uh, um, with dementia and large stroke has led to learning from their death and change management and, and practices on the ward. So in summary, this patient uh, Overall care was 3.5, even though on the outset it might have appeared as if there's nothing to really learn from this patient's death, although this case was an avoidable death. So when we regularly analyze these patients' deaths, we find that you could do various forms of uh, um, analysis. You could do certain thematic analysis, or one of the simple analysis is a word, word cloud analysis of the different statements that reviewers make. You could see that when, when you look at the initial admission phase, the words like good and plan come as big, and some of them are appropriate. Um, so it is encouraging that we may be doing well. Having said that, we still also see statements like poor. I like to see this poor in a, in a much smaller font in, in going forwards. When you look at the end of life phase, the words like good care, come as very big, that means we are doing fairly well in those fears. But still, the words like palliative care appears very small, that means we need to increase our awareness and, and engagement. So common themes that uh, arise from analyzing these patients' deaths are the opportunities taken or missed during the patient's admission. 
and early warning score recognition is an important part of managing our patients. Senior review and case review timing and the fact that they need to be delivered on a timely manner is important in our department. So there, there are various themes that are generated and then this can lead to sets of data sets we can look into and we then inform the clinical governance process and saying that there's a problem in this department for antibiotic prescribing or there is a problem in this department that the consultants are not reviewing the patients uh, uh, in a timely fashion. So then uh, uh, the processes can put, be put in place to improve um, such failings. So it is not easy to, uh, um, as, as Professor Fernando said, herd uh, a group of uh, consultants um, and, and junior doctors to engage in, in, in clinical governance process because there's a tendency to believe that uh, this is only for managers. But if you are interested in improving patient care and safety, then I think you will uh, want to engage um, in this process. So resource allocation is a big problem because uh, none of us are paid to do this. Uh, so we do this on our, in our own time um, because we want to improve patient care and safety. Um, and, and there are sometimes competing interests in the department. For example, if I have an M&M meeting or an audit meeting, uh, somebody will say, can you please give it up to uh, allow a professor from um, uh, and may or clinic to give you a talk on polar bears in Arctic. So you, you'll be asked to give up your slot. So you'll have to fight f uh, to, to ensure that you know, we have time to disseminate the knowledge that we learn. And the other challenge we face is that when we identify problems, how are we going to plug that into the clinical governance processes? And there are, there are barriers to that as well. So in summary, I would like you to consider learning from deaths uh, an important process to improve outcome for your patients. And a standardized tool exists called Structured Judgment uh, Review Tool. This can be, you can modify this the way you want to use in your hospitals. And this will generate qualitative and quantitative data sets, which then over time you can look into see whether there are any themes. And I, I fully appreciate that this is the model that we have chosen and, and there are loopholes and one size does not fit all models. And I'd like to thank uh, the following people and also the Royal College of Physicians for sharing some of the slides. Um, and I'm like Prof. Fernando, I'm very happy for you to use my slides if you want to. Thank you.